Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Hey there, guys. This is Rita. This is Amanda, and you're listening to I, I Don't, Don't Know, know her. her, the podcast where we talk about women you may not know, but you should for sure. And you will. So uh, <laughs> I have something to talk to Rita about that I haven't told her about. Oh, dear God. You have to wait till we're <laughs> recording. <laughs> Lay it on me. So one of my favorite actresses, and I think somebody you also like a lot. Okay. Kind of had a pretty big misstep this weekend. <gasps> oh, tell me. It's Gina Rodriguez. What does she do? I know, right? <laughs> okay, so Gina has made a couple. It's actually more than one. A few missteps in her... I don't know. It's very hard to for me as somebody who's not, not a person of color to talk about it, but mm-hmm. I've... I'm on Twitter and I go on things like The Root. And so I know about these things and I feel like we should probably address how we would handle a situation like this. Mm -hmm. So the latest one is that she was at some forum talking about the wage gap. Okay. And she made a comment that said something to the nature of white women make more than black women, black women make more than Asian women and Asian women make more than Latino women. Mm -hmm. And people were like, um, (laughs) no. Mm -hmm. And it's like the third or fourth thing she's said in the last year or so. That's sort of been what people online are calling anti-blackness. Really? Yeah. And it really bums me out. Yeah. Yeah. Because what it's, What that does is it puts you, it just, we already have so much against us. And one more thing is not what you need. And I think that it's like she, after Black Panther, she said something to the effect of like, where's the Latino superheroes? After Girls Trip, she said, where's the Latino Girls Trip movie? And I get what she's saying. Mm -hmm. I get, I get that she's saying, you know, we need our movies to... But the problem is, is that she's pitting it against black women. Which it's like finally coming to the forefront. Like I remember watching, I took my son to go see Black Panther and to be able to sit in a a movie theater with all African people on, you know, African American people like on the screen. I I was crying because I was like, this is amazing. And finally, you know, a superhero of color on the big screen for my kid who's also a child of color, it's like, it's amazing. It's, it's empowering. It's like to take away from that. I don't see the purpose or the point. Yeah. I don't think it's a good idea. And I also, I think one of the things that's a problem with it is that black people aren't the ones who created the problem. Mm -hmm. So don't attack black people because they're finally getting a movie like girls trip, Mm -hmm. you know, attack the white establishment that has created a situation wherein there's one role for a person of color in an ensemble cast of eight. Mm -hmm. And so you're automatically pitted against whoever is the other person of color in the room. Don't do that. Or, Hey, get the movie made yourself. Like you've got money, you've got friends, you've got influence. You can get people writing. You can bring people together. How about do it for yourself? And I guess there was an event earlier in the year as well, where she was celebrating Latinas in general Mm -hmm. and somebody asked her like why are there no Afro Latinos there and she said I don't know any whoa and that's does she laugh like that or no I don't know like and I think it was on Twitter okay again I read all of this over the weekend and so it's like I might be you know crossing some wires here but the the reality is one of course you know some Afro Latina actresses in fact, I've seen multiple pictures of her with Rosario Dawson. Mm-hmm. And hello, Tessa Thompson. There are plenty of actresses that she could have invited into her group. There's this sort of erasure that like black culture isn't also sometimes Latino culture. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I feel like, you know, she does do so much good stuff. And she has her like movement Mondays, if you follow her on Instagram, where she highlights usually a woman of color, usually a Latina woman about like this, this person's great, whatever this great person is doing, you know, similar mm-hmm. to what we're doing with our podcast. Okay. And I think that for the most part, she does know better. I think she does. Mm-hmm. 
And I think that in her quest to sort of push Hollywood to be more inclusive, she's created an exclusionary environment. That's not okay. It's not. And I think that she can come out of this if she will listen Mm -hmm. to what black activists and thinkers and other actors are saying and acknowledge that and apologize for it and say, you know what, I've, I've made this mistake and I want to move forward and I want to be better. Mm -hmm. And thank you for calling me out and teaching me and giving me the opportunity to listen. Yeah. So the reason why I wanted to bring up for this podcast is because I know that inevitably we will have already probably stumbled over something, said the wrong thing, used the wrong term. Yeah. Made an assumption. Misinformation. Yeah. And I think it's really super important that if that happens and someone listens to our podcast and says, hey, that's not cool. Mm -hmm. Instead of being defensive or ignoring it entirely, I would like for us to address it, take it on, you know, head on and, and improve. I agree. No, I, I wonder too with her if she just doesn't know, maybe she doesn't recognize her behavior. You said it's kind of being called out on Twitter and on social media and stuff. And in articles, and okay. it's all over. Has she responded no. to anything? Okay, so she's probably talking to like her people and trying to figure out the correct response. And Yeah, uh, I've been obsessively checking her social media to see if she's addressed it or even re- responded to a comment. Mm-hmm. But so far, haven't seen anything from her. Hmm. Might take a minute. And I do hope that that's what's happening. I hope that She's not just ignoring it. Mm -hmm. I hope she's reading it, digesting it and figuring out how to, how to address it in a way that is appropriate and will be a model for how other people should do so in the future. Mm -hmm. That's what I hope anyway, because I do really like her a lot (laughs) and she's She's, done really good things and we don't do things perfectly and it's always a learning. It's always time to learn. So I hope, like you said, Take a breath, come back, and put your best foot forward. I hope so. She's not the first. Yeah. And she won't be the last. And it's okay, I think. I mean, it's really hard in this culture right now. I feel like anybody who makes a mistake, it's like you're branded with a mistake for the rest of your life at the Mm -hmm. moment. People are very angry and quick to be angry. Mm -hmm. I'm guilty of it myself. Me where too. I'm like, oh, fuck that guy. I'm <laughs> writing that person off. I'm never going to listen to them again. But I don't, I don't think that that's actually helpful. What I think is more helpful is when you see these think pieces being written about the way in which you've said something and the ways in which you have created a sort of combative relationship with other women of color. Mm-hmm. That's where you should say, okay, whoopsies. I need to take a step back. I need to fix it. Anything of pressing note you'd like to discuss? Anything of pressing note? Hmm. I want to, I want to hear who you've got. You want me to start? I do. Okay. I have a badass. (laughs) You got a lot of paper there. (laughs) I know I do. I really do. I was really worried that, uh, this person's life wouldn't fill up enough time. And Mm -hmm. then I ended up with six pages. Oh shit. Okay. Yeah. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm going to talk today about Junko Tabe. I don't know her. <laughs> the first woman to summit Mount Everest. <gasps> Ooh! Right? Yes! Okay. Junko Ishibashi was born on September 22nd, 1939 in Miharu in the Fukushima Prefecture, which is in central Japan, about 140 miles north of Tokyo. So it's pretty rural. Mm-hmm. She was the fifth daughter in a family of seven children. Yeesh. And it's, she was born in 1939. If you orient yourself in time, mm-hmm. that is the beginning of World War II. Okay. And so during World War II, her family lived in abject poverty in this rural area of Japan. And it was an agricultural area, and it had very limited access to what the comforts of city life would have. They didn't really have running water, no electricity, very rural, very poor area that she was growing up in. She was a tiny child, just absolutely like just tiny, tiny, tiny. And she was seen 
and viewed by other people as being weak and frail. Oh. Yeah. When she was 10 years old, she went on a school trip to hike Mount Nasu in Nico National Park, which is a little mountain about 6,000 feet high. Okay. So Bozeman as a town is about 6,000 feet. Actually, it's a little over. It's almost 7,000 feet. So you can, it's not very high. Yeah. But this is her first time going out into nature ever. Oh, wow. And she said this about the, that first experience. I was so surprised by the rocky dry hills and a stream of hot water that came from an onsen, hot spring. I was shocked to feel a little chilly while we were on top of the mountain because it was summer. I realized that there are so many things in the world which I have never encountered and that it is fun to see and learn directly through one's own experiences. So I became determined to go wherever I could go. Oh, those profound moments, right? What was your first time being in nature that made you go, oh, this is cool? Uh, first time in nature, I would say um, my family and I, we used to road trip a lot. And we went to the Redwood National Forest. Oh, cool. I've and never it been there. was beautiful. And it's so quiet. And I mean, just looking up at those giant trees. And I remember um, finding a pine cone that was like the size of a dog. <laughs> it was huge. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, look at this pine cone. I was like, I feel like a fairy in a forest. And so I went and collected probably 20 of them and we're hiking so I'm carrying all of these and my dad's like Rita put the pine cones down I'm like nope and so I had these giant pine cones that I brought back home and one of those moments of just like awe yeah when you're wonder. in awe of nature yeah I um grew up in a rural agricultural area similar to Junco I grew up in eastern Montana on the Canadian and North Dakota borders and while it is a natural space in terms of there's not a lot of cities. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of like really explorative areas. So the very first hike I ever went on was the summer between my junior and senior years of high school. Mm -hmm. and wow. It, that's the first one. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like Whoa. everybody's like, Oh, you're from Montana. You must've been so outdoorsy. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you count, um, riding in a golf cart. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really do a whole lot of outdoor exploration. <laughs> I see. Okay. So I went to Missoula. I was in a, I was actually taking a college class, a film class there that I was getting college credit for while I was still in high school. And the dorm leaders that were sort of chaperoning us, I guess you would say, mm -hmm. they decided to organize a weekend hike. And we took like a 10 passenger van and all of us who were in the class and we went up to, and I think it was actually over by Sealy Lake, which isn't too far from Missoula. I remember it was, it was like a good hour long drive to get to wherever we were going. Okay. And we had this hike, which I'd never hiked before. And of course the elevation in Missoula was way higher than where I was from. Oh no. And, um, I struggled. Were you, were you wheezing? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was at the back of the pack, like, <gasps> <laughs> and I and I just remember thinking like this is not for me. I don't want to do this. And then we got to the top, and there was the most beautiful cascading waterfall I have ever seen in my life, even to this day. Oh wow! It just it was incredibly gorgeous, and it was huge. And I was in so much awe of it. I hadn't I'd seen those kinds of things in pictures. Mm -hmm. I had been to Yellowstone as a child, but we drove through Yellowstone. We didn't get out and do anything because my parents were old oh, okay. and my mom was a heavy smoker. They also weren't into exploration. <laughs> <laughs> so we just sat in the car and drove by everything. We didn't actually like do anything in Yellowstone. So this was my first time ever being in actual nature on a trail. And that was the moment when the switch flipped for me. Mm -hmm. And I became a really avid hiker and trail runner when I went to college and camping. And I used to cut and build trails. Mm -hmm. So it, it was really a monumentally so changing moment. I never moment. knew that about you. that Because, I mean, I'm very much PNW. I mean, I've been in camping and fishing and hiking since I was a kid. And you and your wife are right there, like, pretty. I mean, they're avid campers and hikers and... Um, I just always thought you had done that. Nope. <laughs> I just thought, I didn't know that, that it took, yeah, until you were like, what, 17? Yeah, it was the summer I turned 17. Wow. Mm -hmm. 
So that's why when I read that, I was like, oh, I get it. I get how that would be a moment where things just switched. Switched, yeah. So after that, she decided she wanted to climb as much as possible. (laughs) And except that climbing then and climbing now is a very expensive hobby. Yes. It takes very specialized equipment that costs a ton of money. And of course, I'm sure in the 1940s, it was even more scarce. Mm Mm-hmm. So, and efficient. <laughs> and, and her family obviously couldn't afford it. So she didn't get to do very much climbing during high school. Uh, she got into college, which was actually pretty rare for girls in her area. Mm-hmm. And she went to Showa Women's University, which was a private university in Tokyo for women, where she studied English and American literature. Cool. Also similar to I me. I was going to say. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. There weren't very many, like I said, very many women or girls who went to high school or who even went to high school in Fukushima, the region that she was from, yeah. let alone to college. So she was a really big outlier in that. And she said that when she went to college, she was very embarrassed a lot of the time and huh. didn't talk to anybody because the Tokyo girls would make fun of her country accent. Oh, geez. Yeah. Mean girls. Go to hell. <laughs> I know, but I, I think I understand, you know, I changed the way I talked when I went to college too. Hmm. While she was in college, she met another woman who liked to climb and the two of them would go on weekend trips together to climb mountains around Tokyo and in nice. other parts of Japan. I love hiking with people. It's so much fun. It's one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. We need to do more this summer. We should. So during this time, she met a group of male climbers who were in an alpine club, and that made her super jealous. She was like, I want to be in a club where (laughs) that's what we do together. And she didn't really have access to a group like that. So she did try, though, in 1962, she joined a small mountaineering group. And so every chance she got, she was climbing or training, and she was going with them. And it was obviously a mostly male group. Mm -hmm. I think she was the only woman in the group. Wow. And she said that she found climbing with men to be frustrating. (laughs) (laughs) I can kind of relate to that because running with men is frustrating. Yeah. Well, they, they, especially at this moment in time, it's, it's 1962. She's in, in Japan and she is this country girl, right? Mm-hmm. So they often thought that the only reason that she and any other women were climbing was because they wanted to find a husband. Okay. And so there were some men who refused to climb with her because she was a woman. Jeez. She actually was on a really dangerous climb up a mountain called Tanagawa. And on that climb, she met her future husband, oh. Masanobu Tabe. Initially, her family disapproved of him because, especially her mother, because he had not gone to college. He wasn't a university guy. He wasn't going to be a professional. Mm -hmm. But she was really happy to have found a man who supported her climbing and shared in her passion with her. Mm. And they got married in 1965. So I guess she's at this point, let's see, 26. So it's actually like I got married in, how old was I? I don't even know how old no, I was. I, w- I got married when I was 25, yeah. Yeah. I, I, the first time I got married, though, I was 21. Oh, that's young. It was really young. That's really young. I just had a baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we were engaged when I was 19. Oh, goodness. In my first marriage. Graciousness. It was way too young. I just I didn't, had, I didn't have any idea what I was doing. <laughs> so by the mi- mid-1960s, Junko had scaled all of Japan's highest peaks, including Mount Fuji. Wow. She had also climbed the Matterhorn in the Swiss Alps. But even still, there were men in the climbing world who treated her with disdain and thought she wasn't a real climber. (laughs) So she decided, she started to develop this dream of a whole team of women climbers going to the Himalayas, which are the highest mountains in the world. Cool. Cool. So after graduating that same year, she formed her own all-women climbing group. (laughs) She called it the Ladies Climbing Club. And their goal, their first goal was to summit Annapurna in the Himalayas. But at that time, any club that wanted to go to the Himalayas had to be a registered member of the Japan Mountaineering Association. Oh, gosh. And had to be recommended by the JMA in order to get a permit to go to the Himalayas. Let me guess. It's all... 
run by men? Yes. Okay. And so her club was rejected. Of course it was. But eventually, like, they, I think they submitted their permit, I think I read online, three times. And the last time they were finally approved. And so in 1970, they went on their expedition to Annapurna in the Himalayas. And they were led by Junko Tebe. And on this Annapurna, so Annapurna is a really big mountain in the Himalayas. Mm-hmm. It's not the biggest, but it's very large. They actually became the first group to cut a new path on the south oh, side of the mountain. Wow. Something that women had never done before. So the climb was not very easy, though, because the temperature on the mountains dropped so low that the film in their cameras broke. Jeez. <laughs> and their gear was extremely heavy, and they all were suffering from really bad altitude sickness. Yeah, that's kind of like you get loosey-goosey, right? You, your brain is basically suffocating. Right? Yeah, because you have a lack of oxygen yeah. because of the, uh, the high the elevation. altitude. So they they didn't want to admit that they were having altitude sickness oh, because they ladies. didn't want the men who to, doubted yeah. them to be correct, yes. you know, that they couldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't want them to be corrected. Oh yeah. They're so weak and they can't do this, mm-hmm. but they, they actually did. They forged on even through all of the al- altitude sickness. And then Junko and another climber from the group, Hiroko Hurakawa summited the peak on May 19th, 1970. Wow. So after that, after successfully conquering Annapurna, they set their eyes on Mount Everest. <laughs> the so, mountain of mountains. Yeah. Yes, the mountain of mountains. The mountain of mountains. I kind of have like a secret like pipe dream. I, I would love to try to do that. <laughs> my uh, my ultimate goal, my like physical goal, has been for years to be able to do the Bridger Ridge Run. Oh, yeah, you told me about that, yeah. And that's, it It, it gains and loses, like, I don't even remember, like, 7,000 feet or something. Jeez. So that's as much as I want to do, though. Yeah. Especially after lis- after reading and listening to what, what happened to her. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no, thank you. <laughs> uh, so within her group, the Ladies Climbing Club, there was a small group that they were calling the Japanese Women's Everest Expedition. And it consisted of about 15 women, most of whom were working women. And they worked in trades like teaching, computer programming, counseling. Hmm. So everyday, everyday mm-hmm. women. Yeah. But they were all wor- almost all working women, mm-hmm. which I think that was the distinction. Oh, okay. They didn't stay home. Mm-hmm. Most of them. Some of them were um, just, they, they had, I keep saying just, and I feel like that's really shitty. I don't mean that. I mean that like, in addition to mm-hmm. being, uh, and then two of them were mothers. Oh, wow. And one of those two was Junko. <laughs> she, in 1972, she gave birth to her first child, which is a daughter named Noriko. So during, during that time, the early 1970s, getting a permit to climb Mount Everest was extremely difficult. Only a few were given out and under very strict requirements. And her club had to wait five years to get a permit. And in the meantime, they turned... Five years? Five years. So they had decided in 1970 that they wanted to hike Mount Everest, mm-hmm. and they couldn't get a permit for five years. Is is it about legalities, or you have to wait for some... Is there a lot of people that are climbing before you, or five it years? It said is- that there was very strict requirements, but it didn't tell me what those were. Okay. And... They were able to get permits for other mountains and they turned them down hmm. because they wanted to wait for the Mount Everest one. Yeah. Because whenever they got, like, if they got another permit for another mountain, mm-hmm. they would be training for that mountain instead of Everest. Hmm. And Junko didn't want that. Yeah. She wanted them to be training for Everest. Yeah. So the whole five years that they waited for their permit, that's what they were doing, was getting ready to climb Mount Everest. Wow. Five years. And uh, she was. One of the two women in the group who ha- who were mothers, and because they were mothers and because they were women in general, a lot of people disapproved of the group and mm. their goal, and they were often told that they were bad moms <laughs> because they were out climbing and that they should be home raising their children instead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the men who do it that are fathers, though, are they bad fathers? No. Of course not. That's what men do, right? 
Men are allowed to be away from the home and, and women are not. And to, and to just put it out there, I'm not a man hater. I'm not, but I, I am a, a hater of a double standard. Yes. <sighs> That's what makes us feminists. Yeah. I, got, I got called a man hater the other day and I was like, fuck you. <laughs> I'm not a man hater. Who called you a man hater? One of my coworkers. <laughs> oh, fuck your coworkers sometimes. Oh, God. And they're like, it's just because you're a man hater. And I was like, mm, you want to go fight? <laughs> I thought that we had moved past the idea that you could be a feminist and still have room and space in your life for men. Mm-hmm. I remember growing up and the stereotype of a lesbian was that, oh, well, they just hate men. Yeah. And I was like, well, I don't hate men. I'm not a lesbian <laughs> then, right? I thought we had all moved past that. And I got a job working for an organization here in Spokane that I will not name because it would surprise a lot of people. I got pulled into a meeting with my supervisors where they told me, they didn't suggest it, they told me, that because I was a lesbian, I hated men. Oh my God. And I was like, what the fuck? Uh, <laughs> and that was in like mm, what is 2012, 13. Oh, I think shit. it was not that long ago. No. And I was like, wow, you don't, you don't know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. I just didn't want to, with my remarks, I don't want it to seem like I'm a man hater. I'm not, like I said, I'm just a hater of a double standard. I just do not like that. It's like, it, every time if you flip that around and said that about men, it would be no, which is unfair. Yeah, it is. It's inequality. Fact. So many of the women in the group had to finance their climbing themselves. So on the side, Junko taught piano lessons. And she also, her her job job was working as an editor for a science magazine. Ooh. But the climb to Mount Everest was going to be hugely expensive. This isn't like the weekend climbs or the trips around to Asian mountains that mm-hmm. she could more that were more affordable. Mount Everest was going to be a huge expense. So most male climbers were able to get sponsorships to mm-hmm. pay for the climb, but no one wanted to sponsor the Japanese women's Everest expedition. Hmm. There's that double standard There's again. There's the double standard again. Eventually, Junko was able to convince a newspaper and a TV station to accompany them and sponsor them. She was basically like, if you guys come, you'll have the inside scoop on the first women to ever climb this Mount Everest. This is a big story. Yeah. And that's how she got them to sponsor the, the group. But they still didn't sponsor the group entirely. They did not pay for the full trip. So Junko and the other members, every single one of them had to come up with 1.5 million yen which is about $5,000. That's oh, a lot of money. In 1975. That's all even more money. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so it was equal to a year's salary for oh. most people in Japan. Jesus Christ. So I would imagine like it would be $40,000. that You'd have to come up with just to go on. And that's, that's with sponsorship. If they hadn't had any sponsors, who, who knows? knows? It, they obviously wouldn't have been able to do it. So in order to save money... These industrious women, I love them. Junko and some of the other women came up with some very ingenious ways to cut corners for costs. They would go to junkyards and find cars, and they would take the seat covers off the cars, like off the car Mm -hmm. seats, and they would use the leather to make waterproof pouches so they could hold their food. Oh, cool. And they created overgloves, leather overgloves out of car seats. She also purchased goose feathers from China and she made her own. Uh oh, where did my page go? Sleeping bag. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So she bought goose feathers from China and made her own sleeping bag. And the members who were teachers, they ended up collecting jam packets from their students. Jam packets? Yeah. You know, like uh, what I was picturing is like, you know, when you're a kid and you go, to a to diner s- to diners yeah. and they have a little or like school lunches yeah probably had little jam packets yeah so they would collect them for their teachers and bring them to them oh so they could take them on their trip yeah that is awesome well that's well that would be good because that's instant energy and right. the sugar would go straight to your system that would be a nice little boost if you were feeling a little droopy yeah it reminds me of like the gel that we eat when we're oh. marathon training Ugh. which i can't do running gel i'd i choke it down yeah <laughs> it's so gross 
So finally, in 1975, they set out to summit Mount Everest, along with a television crew, three journalists, four cameramen, 23 support climbers, and 500 porters. What's a porter? I don't know. (laughs) I was like, that's a lot of people. Well, a porter? I don't know. I don't know either. I mean, I, I think of a porter as somebody who like, delivers you know like brings things and fills Hmm. things and whatever so i think they were maybe something like that okay so uh the climbers decided to follow the path of edmund hillary and he was the first climber ever to summit and i do know edmund hillary's name yes everybody knows (laughs) edmund hillary's name i feel like yeah i mean i know nothing about climbing and i was like oh yeah sir edmund hillary i know who that is yeah the hillary step on mount everest it's like the hardest point to cross yes on everest He was the first climber to summit the mountain in 1953, so it's 22 years later. The group was about 6,300 meters up the mountain, or a little over 20,000 feet, when an avalanche buried them. Oh, no. They were all sleeping in their tents, and around midnight the snow struck, and Junko was tangled up in her tent, and four other women and their guides were on top of her. Oh, jeez. Underneath the snow. She was pinned down by chunks of ice and her face was covered by another woman's hair smothering her. Jeez. Isn't that gross? Yeah. And terrifying. Junko went unconscious for six minutes. Oh, jeez. And during that time, a Sherpa, which is a climbing guide from Mm -hmm. the Himalayas, grabbed her knife, cut through the tent fabric, and busted through the snow. And once he was free... They were able to drag everyone else out, including Junko, who had to be pulled out by her ankles. Jeez. Uh, It took three days for her to be able to walk again. Whoa. Yeah, because she had lost oxygen for so long. Yeah. And she was buried. So she couldn't walk or move normally for about three days. And the doctors at the base camp insisted that they turn around. But Junko refused. (laughs) She's like, nope, I came here with one job in mind and I'm (laughs) going to fucking do do it. So when the team ascended to Camp 4, many of the Sherpas were suffering from altitude sickness and couldn't carry up the oxygen tanks for the last part of the journey. Mm -hmm. So here we have another stumbling block. Mm -hmm. They can't do it without oxygen. And the people who are supposed to be their guides that do this pretty frequently, they're the ones who are like, I'm too sick. Yeah. So at that point, they had to make a choice. They couldn't all go up the side of the mountain the rest of the way. They had to choose who was going to stay behind and who could go. So Aiko Hasano, who was the team leader, decided that it should be Junko to go. So when Junko uh, reached the south summit, she discovered a narrow, icy ridge flanked by 15,000 foot drops. She'd read every climber's account of the climb to Mount Everest, but she'd never read anything about this part of the mountain. Oh, jeez. So she was forced to crawl sideways with her body straddling the ridge. And she said, I'd never felt that tense my entire life. I felt all my hair standing on end. Oh, oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) Junko was on her hands and knees all the way to the top. When she finally arrived at the top, it was a flat rectangular area that she described as the size of a tatami mat which is about three <laughs> feet by six feet. Oh, jeez. I think that's it. That's the top. <laughs> that's this whole... F- <laughs> the, the couch that the we're couch sitting we're on. The couch we're sitting on to record. <laughs> that's this whole thing. That's, that's the top of Mount Everest. Jeez. And so when she got there, she took a thermos of coffee and she buried it into the snow to wake what she called the resident mountain goddess and announce her arrival. <laughs> Junko did not know it at the time, but while she was standing on the summit, a Chinese expedition that included women was coming up the other side. Oh, cool. Junko just happened to be the woman who made it first. <laughs> when she returned to Japan, she was an immediate sensation. The media was especially fond of reminding people of her size. She was only four foot nine. That's tiny. Remember earlier I told you she was very tiny when she was yeah. young? <laughs> I didn't, I'm not really big into being like, oh, she was so tiny. Let's talk about how tiny she was because I've hated that in my life. Like mm-hmm. when I was young, I was really, really small and I just hated how much people focused on my size mm-hmm. and it made me always feel like they thought I couldn't do anything because I was little. 
So I avoided it until it became like, oh, well, the media made a big deal about it. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you what she was. She was four foot nine. She hated all of the attention she got. (laughs) So she just decided to continue climbing. In 1978, she gave birth to her second child, a son named Shinya. In 1980, she summited Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. Oh, wow. Mount Aconcagua in Argentina. Denali in Alaska in 1988. Are you catching the, the pattern? Is she hitting every peak? The seven, is it? Mount Elbrus in Russia in 1989, Vincent Massif in Antarctica in 1991, and Puchak Jaya in 1992. These peaks are the highest peaks on all seven <laughs> continents, making Junko the first woman to complete the seven summits. Oh, wow. That is awesome. Yeah, so she not only was the first woman to summit Mount Everest, she did the first, first woman seven. to do all seven peaks. Wow. Her next climbing goal, because she couldn't stop there. <laughs> well, she said when she was a kid that she was going to climb everything. Yeah, she wanted to go wherever she could go. Mm-hmm. Her next climbing goal was to reach the highest peak in every country. Oh, wow. In 2000, because she still wasn't done, she went back to school to get a postgraduate degree in environmental science. Oh, jeez. And her, her thesis, like her studying, was especially concerned with how much waste and garbage was degrading mountains, and specifically Mount Everest. Hmm. Because the, the permitting process to go up Mount Everest got a lot easier, mm-hmm. so a lot more people were doing it, and they were leaving behind literal tons of garbage. It was destroying Mount Everest. Mm-hmm. It still is. She also wrote books and became the director of the Himalayan Adventure Trust of Japan. By her 70th birthday, she had climbed the highest peaks in 56 countries and authored seven books. Wow. In 2012, she was diagnosed with stomach cancer, but that didn't slow her down. By age 76, she had scaled the highest peaks in 76 countries. Jeez. And every summer since 2012, she climbed the 12,388-foot Mount Fuji with high schoolers, from northeastern Japan, including kids from Fukushima, the area that she was from, which was also hit very hard by the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. Mm-hmm. That's how come I knew of that region. They were completely decimated by that tsunami. Yeah. So she wa- she wanted to do something good for the kids of the area she grew up in, and so she would take them on these trips up Mount Fuji. So ever since 2012, that's what she'd been doing. Wow. In July of 2016... She could only make it halfway, but she cheered the students on to the finish. And later that year, on October 20th, 2016, Junko Tabe died in a hospital near Tokyo. She was 77. Hmm. When Outside Magazine interviewed her several months before her death, she was asked what motivated her to keep climbing. And this is what she said. It is because I love mountains. I love to go wherever I've never been before. Oh, that is awesome. So, gosh, her story makes me sad. Like, <laughs> happy sad. You I know? was going to say not sad, but, but emotional. Yeah, like, yeah. I just, I wish she was still alive. Yeah. I got most of my information, so I loved, there was this great interview with her in Outside Magazine. Mm-hmm. And I love being able to read the actual words of the people we're talking about. Yeah. And so I liked to throw in a couple of her quotes here because I thought she was just so incredibly fascinating as an actual person to listen to. I also found a really great, uh, I found a really great, what do you call them? Okay. I found a really great obituary of her in the New York Times. I also use Wikipedia and Encyclopedia Britannica and the Heroin Collective. That was awesome. She yeah. sounds fantastic. I know. There was um, one similar experience I had of that, you know, taking a minute to look at the top. It was, I was doing my first run on Mount Spokane, like my first mountain, like pretty heavy duty trail run. And I had read that it was like, oh, just a trail run, you know, beautiful scenery, blah, blah, blah. So I'm thinking like cut trails and like, cool. Yeah. I can do that. We'll run in circles around this mountain. No, you run down the mountain, then you run back up. <laughs> oh, yikes. And it wasn't cut trails. Like, even a part of it, I had to cross a stream. Like, I did my shoes and my socks. I didn't prepare for that. 
I was like coming around one scissor bend and like something hissed at me from the bushes. I was like, fuck! <laughs> Started running faster. <laughs> it was pretty brutal. And then the last two miles were straight uphill on no trail. It was just up the mountainside. I can't even believe you did that. It was it was one of the hardest runs of my life and actual like I got to an actual point where I was thinking I'm insane. Why would you voluntarily do this? But then <laughs> <laughs> right I just I was mad at myself and I was pissed and I got up to the top and it was just beautiful and I st- I stopped and I looked at it and I took a moment to just be like I'm healthy. I can physically do this. Mm. I can I got up here on my own steam and it's it's beautiful. And I just took a minute and I said, "Thank you." And then I kept on running. It was awesome. I like moments like that. I think I'll never be a trail runner <laughs> again. It's hard. I so last year I set a goal to run a race every month. And I had two trail races in a row. One in April and one in May Mm -hmm. and the one in April I was on the last half a mile when I looked up to see you know where am I going and I went to look back down and I looked back down a little too late and my right foot as I was running my right foot landed on a rock and my ankle twisted to the right and it snapped and the woman running behind me stopped and she was like are you okay? Are you okay? And and I'm, I'm holding my ankle and I'm like in shock. Like it's just like reverberating through my entire mm-hmm. body. And she looks around and she was like, Oh, where's the, where's the branch? I'll move it out of the way. And I was like, what are you talking about? She was like, I, well, I heard the snap when you hit the branch. And I was like, Oh, oh no, that was no. my ankle. Uh. And that's the injury that I've been recovering from. But mm-hmm. I thought I was like, okay. So I took like three weeks off. Seemed like it was okay. It was a little tight. It hurt. Um, And then I did my second trail race and I was running up the mountain, up the hill. I mean, it wasn't a mountain. And I just fucking fell like face first onto the ground. I I remember that. I was like, she came back with some bumps. (laughs) I was was like, like, what happened? Apparently this is not my field of forte. (laughs) Like I am not going to be a trail runner. I will fall every time. So I give up. Trails are are difficult. Climbing is difficult. Running trails is difficult. So anybody who can do it and keep doing it, I I applaud. Yeah, I I've trailed run quite a bit. Trailed and run. Trailed run. Randed. <laughs> <laughs> You've run I'm a some really trail good runs. order. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, ran trails, and it's super hard on my joints mm-hmm. because um, there's no give, and then you're you're too you're climbing you're half climbing and running at the same time well the thing i think that's hard for my body is that it's uneven all the time Mm -hmm. you know everything there's no flat there's no like solid flat surface for your feet to hit Mm -hmm. you know it's like one minute you're going to be dropping down one minute you're going higher one minute you're on a a root of a tree and the next year at a rock and my ankles are just too weak for that yeah i could i can understand though junko's I don't want to call it addiction, but just love of that moment of when you achieve and you Mm -hmm. reach that goal. There's nothing like it. There is. It feels like you're walking on air. Yeah. And I think I'm a goal oriented person. Mm -hmm. So I really identified with her like, well, I checked that goal off. Now I got this goal to do Mm -hmm. because the whole reason I was doing the race, I wanted to do a race every month because I thought that's a cool goal. I just want that goal. Yeah. (laughs) And I was very close to being able to do it. But life happens. Then ankle injury happened. (laughs) And actually me and Amanda are, are starting up again. We're starting our running adventure. Yep. Um, I've been, so going from running marathons and running mountains, I've turned into a daily smoker. (laughs) And I I still, I know she hates that I smoke. I, I smoked for 10 years. And I quit for 10 years. And then I just picked it all right back up again. It snuck it back into my life. And I know it's inhibiting my my lungs because I bike and I do small trails. I don't do anything too vigorous. And, and you can feel it. It burns. So Amanda's got, um, she wrote a whole plan. She's rallied some troops. <laughs> and we're like a fucking plan, y'all. It's... <laughs> 
I'm a little type A. <laughs> Detail oriented. I enjoy it though because I feel like she did it for me. So I have it. She's like, no excuses. You have a plan in your hand. And I'm like, she's right. I have no excuses. I have a goddamn plan in my hand right here. So we're starting to I don't know what we're going to we're we're shooting for a half. I I'm gonna, I'm shooting for a half, but I'm also going to be very cognizant of my body. Mm-hmm. And if I'm pushing too hard, I'll drop back to a 10k. Mm-hmm. But I'm really hoping. I mean, it's it's a quite a bit of time and I built the plan so that we could all build slowly. Mm-hmm. So hopefully by April we'll be running we'll a half be running marathon. A half. I know. I've I've run probably maybe six seven halves so it'll be like i think my eighth or ninth i don't know i lost track i i think i don't remember how many halves i've run but i'm are you counting official or the ones that we've trained as well (laughs) (laughs) oh no if i counted that i would be like i've run like 75 half marathons (laughs) but I, i the last half i ran Oh, it was a while ago, probably 2014 or 2015. Was that the one we ran together? The one in the summer? We we ran the Windermere. Didn't you do the full? No, I did the half. Oh. Yeah, that was the one where Abby was on her bike and she was at the water stations. That was really cool, by the way. So like her wife and like my best friend, she's there on her bike and she's like at every water station cheering us on. And I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> I know that is the best. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, if you're interested in hopping on our bandwagon, you can leave us some comments or whatever and tell us how you're doing on your on your trek. So for me, because I'm going from having a pretty big setback of an injury. I know it sounds like, oh, you poor baby, you had an ankle injury, but you know, you can't walk on an ankle that's broken. And I was in physical therapy and they were like, oh, we actually think you fractured your cuboid bone, like any vibrations to the cuboid Mm -hmm. bone, which meant walking, running, jumping, anything like that was out of the question. I couldn't even, I wasn't even allowed to ride my bike uphill because it would put too much pressure Mm -hmm. and keep that fracture open the split in my cuboid bone and injuries are serious i i feel too that's one thing that women do do is we ignore it Mm -hmm. and we push through which you know sometimes it's an amazing story like yeah i pushed through it now it's blatant and i crossed the finish line and then there's other times we're like um do you want to walk for the next 25 years yeah you need to stop for a minute a wise person once said to me do you want to run this race or do you want to run all the races? So you can either run these three miles or you can run three miles for the rest of your life. That's pretty, pretty black and white. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, I guess you're right. And my big race though this year, so last year I was supposed to do a race in July that I was very excited for and I was training very hard for and that ankle injury kept putting me back and putting me back. And then in June, they were like, you can't, you have to mm. stop. So my race was supposed to be in July and they allowed me to defer to this year. So my big race this year that I'm very excited for is doing a duathlon. That's exciting. Yeah. And it's not a very long race by any means, but if you've ever, if you've never tried to do a try or a do where you have to do two different or three different sports in the same race, Mm -hmm. it's, it's so much more challenging than I thought it would be. I was like, oh, it's just biking and running. I do those things all the time. But going from running to sitting on a bike and then to running again, it's incredibly difficult. Like mm. when you get off the bike, if you start to run, it's like your legs are <laughs> lead, like these giant lead boulders. And I just, I, I felt like I was running like a, like a kid, you know, you know, when kids don't, can't really use their legs very yeah. well. <laughs> Like toddlers when they first start running and they <laughs> real lumbery and yeah. yeah and they look like at any point they're going to propel themselves forward and <laughs> hit themselves flat in the face that's how it feels when you get off the bike and you start running you're like i don't know how my muscles are working <laughs> <laughs> so i just had these lead blocks for feet so i really enjoyed that though that was very challenging and i like as Junko did, I like setting a new goal, trying something new, pushing myself farther than I did before, Mm -hmm. which is why 
I was like, oh, I want to try trail running. Oh, I want to do this. Oh, I want to do that. I want to, yeah. I want to run a marathon. I want to run, you know, first it was, I want to run a 5k. Then it was, I want to run a half marathon. Then it was, I want to run a marathon. Then it was, I want to do a trail run. Then it was, I want to do a duathlon. So yeah. that's where I'm at. I'm always constantly trying to do a new thing. I think my white whale of a run is the uh, Seattle marathon. I've heard that that one is probably one of the most difficult in Washington because of all the, the, the elevation in the hills. If anybody's been to Seattle, they know that what those hills look like. And I'm kind of insane and I like running hills. I like chugging forward and I like, because I got a big ass and I got big thighs and I, they hold a lot of <laughs> kick into them. So I always can propel myself pretty far. And so I like doing hills. The girls got booty and it works. <laughs> I hate hills. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I suppose we should probably move on now that we've uh, talked about running forever. Yes. <laughs> this is not a running podcast, I promise. <laughs> we'll stop. We just love running so much. <laughs> so the lady that I brought to the table today is Camilla Williams. Camilla or Camilla? Camilla. Hmm, I don't know her. C-A-M-I-L-L-A. Camilla. She is an American operatic soprano and the first African-American to receive a regular contract with the major American opera company, which was the New York Opera Company. Very cool. I know. I, opera so singer. I was trying to find something that I'm not too comfortable with, I'm trying new things. And I know shit about opera. I know that <laughs> Me I, too. it's kind of nice to listen to, but I'm, I'm, I'm not turning it on while I'm doing the dishes. You know, it's not, <laughs> it's not my jam. You're not grooving to Pavarotti? No, it's okay. not my thing. I do like, I do enjoy some, but a lot of times it's just like this lady shrieking to me but I, don't know. I think that's more of like the big <laughs> sorry all the opera singers out I'm there I'm sorry <laughs> but it it's just something that I've never really known about so I kind of I did some exploring so Camilla was born in October in uh, October 18th 1919 in Danville Virginia uh, she was born to Fanny Carey Williams and Cornelius Booker Williams um, Fanny was a laundress and cook, and Cornelius was a chauffeur. They were very working class, poor. Camilla was the youngest of their four children, um, two of which were two um, stepsisters. Her father was previously married. Camilla called her household, in quotations, modest working class. Uh, her family life revolved around the Black Calvary Baptist Church at 218 Holbrook Street. Uh, her grandfather, Alexander Carey, who had a deep bass voice, was a singer and the choir leader there. He has Camilla singing in the church choir by the age of seven. So I, I can just picture that, you know, yeah. family of modest means, working family. My family was very oriented around church and very um, music, musical. Yes, your family is very musical. Very musical. My and your husband, too, and, and his family. Yeah, absolutely. And same thing. It really struck a note with me because I'm a singer, too, and I learned to sing in the church choir because my family, we were all always going to church, and my dad has a beautiful voice, and his sister has a beautiful voice. My aunt's hu uh, ex-husband now had a wonderful voice and they all played in the church band and they wrote their own music. My dad even toured for a little while. He would have us kids tote along. And so music for me is definitely, um, you can have a lot of bad shit in your life that music can make better. I yes. Think. Especially with families. <laughs> so a quote from Camilla about her grandparents she said, my grandparents and parents were self-taught musicians. All of them sang, and there was always music in our home. From this, at an early age, was born a desire to be a concert singer. All my people sing. We were poor, but God blessed us with music. Which I think is... It's great. Yeah, it, you can be rich in so many other things rather than, you know, money. Uh, so at the age of 12, her talent was recognized by her parents, and she began taking lessons from a Welsh singing teacher named Raymond Aubrey. I researched Raymond. I don't think he was very famous or popular or anything. Could not find Jack. <laughs> I found a ton of obituaries with the name, like 35 obituaries. And I was like, if your last name is, is Aubrey, is Aubrey, do not name him Raymond. <laughs> <laughs> 
there was still Jim Crow laws at that time, though. So those who aren't familiar with Jim Crow laws, which, but Amanda is, um, it just was segregation city and it was upholding, you know, what was the quote, separate but equal, some bullshit like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, that's actually separate but equal came, came around after the Jim Crow laws had been challenged in the courts. Oh, okay. And the courts said, oh yeah, you can have separate but equal, but obviously that'll never that's never true. It's never been true. It'll never be true. Mm -hmm. You can never have two things be the equal if they're separate. If they're separated. You know, like people talked about like, Oh, um, if you went, if you were a black kid going to a university and a white kid going to a university, Mm -hmm. the white kid could go to the university library. The black kid wouldn't be able to, and they would have a separate library that would have like, you know, (laughs) a third of the books in it. Well, that's clearly not equal. Equal. Yeah. Yeah. That, other boys given the advantage exactly yeah so the family decided to conduct the lessons privately in their home and so that's a risk for them as a family and that's also a risk for that music teacher but they believed in her voice so much that they were willing to take that risk to get her lessons she was also a brilliant and diligent student she was valedictorian of her 1937 graduating class of John M. Langston High School. After high school, Williams attended Virginia State College for Negroes, which now is Virginia State University, in Petersburg, Virginia. Upon graduation in 1941, she was named outstanding graduate of her entire class, and she graduated with a degree in music education. Damn. I know. Girl was smart. Girl was was motivated. (laughs) And the pictures of her, girl was beautiful. Just soft and lovely and gorgeous beautiful black woman and also a beautiful singer yes. she's just a whole package Smart, I beautiful listen talented to, to some recordings of her music i actually listened and while i'm like while i was typing stuff i was listening to her singing her voice is amazing it's like birds like flying <laughs> we'll try to get a youtube video of her up on the social there media yeah So she returned to Danville after school between 1941 and 1942, and she taught third grade music uh, at an elementary school. So after her first year of teaching, uh, Virginia State College a cappella choir invited her to be a guest soloist at a concert in Philadelphia. After this performance, Camilla was offered a scholarship from the Philadelphia Alumni Association in Virginia State. Which it's like, why is there a Philadelphia alumni in Virginia? I, I guess I'm, I'm, is it like maybe the Philadelphia, is there, is like an alumni for the co- a college in Philadelphia or something? It said the Philadelphia Alumni Association of Virginia State. So I'm wondering if it's like a chapter. Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That would mean it was probably alumni of Virginia State who live in Philadelphia. So okay. it's probably a Philadelphia chapter. Okay. So they offer Camilla a scholarship on the condition she has to move to Philadelphia for voice training. So she knows it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. She leaves being a teacher. She accepts the offer. And so she studies. She's also working as an usherette, which I liked that it said that. (laughs) Because she couldn't just be an usher. She couldn't be an usher. She's an usherette uh, at the Philadelphia Theater to support herself. Um, People believed in her talent and helped assist in her living costs as well. Her mother's former employer, which was Dr. W.R. Laird and his wife, decided to give her some money. They they believed in her as well. So it's like that speaks volumes that her mother's old boss is like, yeah, Camilla can sing. She needs this money to travel and go to school. Mm-hmm. Here you go. And she also received money from Mrs. L.D. Crumpler of the Danville Music Study club. I know. A I, crumpler. Okay. Is it spelled the same way? It is spelled the same way. Okay. If you haven't been listening to every one of our podcast episodes and you're like, why are they freaking out? <laughs> uh, Rita did Re- Rebecca Lee crumpler, crumpler, who was the first African-American woman to ever uh, become a doctor. Yeah. So this was the Danville Music Study Club. It didn't say if crumpler was black or white, though. So could I be did. either, right? Could be either. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, yes. Honestly, it could be either. At 23 years old, the doors are open for Camilla in Philadelphia. She learned underneath a renowned operatic contralto and Hungarian vocalist, which a contralto is, I looked that up, it's like a deep bass. So you're at the lower range, which kind of struck me odd because she's a soprano. 
So I was like, why is a contralto training a soprano? But I don't know. <laughs> is it spelled like... Oh, that's weird. Okay. Contralto is C-O-N-T-R-A-L-T-O. Huh. Contralto. His name was Marion Freshel. <laughs> Freshel. <laughs> F-R-E-S-C-H-L. Yeah, Freshel. Freshel. I would say that's probably Freshel. Yeah. Marion, who later herself moved on to teach at Juilliard. So this is Marion's level of yeah, influence. Yeah, she's an obviously incredible. Yes, in Camilla's life. She won awards, including the Marian Anderson Award in 1943 and in 1944. Do you know who Marian Anderson is? Yes, I do. <laughs> I love Marian Anderson. So the reason I, I, and I'm adding in here about Marian Anderson, because these two women are living at the same time. And Marian Anderson, she was an African-American concert singer from Philadelphia. And her story is parallel to Camilla's, uh, struggled in the 1920s against poverty, racism, uh, found fame in Europe, and then came back to the States. Came back to Jim Crow, United States. Yep, after being just fawned over in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, Just a darling over there. Uh, She came back in the States in 1939. Uh, The big story, like her poignant story, is the refusal of the DAR, uh, the Daughters of the American Revolution, refusing to let her perform at a hall in D.C. Uh, to an integrated audience. Charles Edward Russell, who was the co-founder of the NAACP and multiple groups, drew attention to this injustice. And it really pissed people off. Yes, it did. <laughs> because she was an incredible acclaimed singer. She was. She was an, a, a gem, a gem of the United States. Yes. Thousands of DAR members left, including Eleanor Roosevelt. Yep. She was quoted as saying, you know, you guys have failed. This is not what the DAR is about. The NAACP decided to organize an on-air concert where she sang, My Country Tis of Thee. Amanda's nodding her head. She's like, I know, I know. My Country Tis of Thee in front of 75,000 people. Yes. If you're ever really interested in learning about Marian Anderson, there's a lot of great stuff. But I highly recommend the children's books that are about her. Who? And that's how I know who she is. When I first started out as an elementary librarian, I would get, you know, I would always get whatever the award-winning books were. Mm-hmm. And there was this really great book about Marian Anderson that I read to the kids. And I was just, I had never heard of her before. Mm-hmm. And I'd read this book and I was like, wow, this is really cool. She's amazing. And then I kept getting more of these children's books that were about her in and the more I learned and the more that these books were being created about her, I thought, why isn't she taught? Like, in why school. isn't she in school? Mm-hmm. Like, why aren't we also, not just in school, but like, I was the kind of person who was raised by television and I loved nothing more than to sit in front of the TV all day on a Saturday and watch VH1 specials. <laughs> yeah. There was never a fucking VH1 special about Marian Anderson. No. I could I could tell you a lot about poison. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> but Please not a don't. whole lot about Marian Anderson, who was obviously way more influential in terms of music yeah, and music, music and history. political stance and mm. anyway. So the reason like I was to- I think I told you earlier I was torn between who to focus on. And I know not a lot of people would know who Marian Anderson is, but when I was doing research on both these women, Camilla was so hard to find and Marianne had just yes so many links and bios and I could find every drop of information I needed to find about her and Camilla who's doing the same thing at the same time was not recognized so you know saying you know she's the first African-American to get a contract it's like well she wasn't the first one to I know (laughs) I know but I feel like she should be highlighted yes And two, that these two women's stories intertwine, I think is fantastic. So the whole reason why we brought up Mary Anderson was because Camilla got the Mary Ann Anderson scholarship or something? she got the award. An award. Yes. Okay. A little bit of history there on Mary Ann Anderson. So Camilla won uh, the award, which was established in 1943 to help young African-American singers. Camilla was the first to receive it two years in a row, which was awesome. Oh, so the fact that Marion was able to kind of forefront that for her was awesome. 
So with money from the awards she received, Camilla starts touring in 1944. She's 25 years old at this time. So could you imagine that? Mm, like, that'd be so cool. That'd be so fun. So during one, but also con- it would not be fun to tour the United States as an African American <gasps> woman in 1944. <laughs> True. <laughs> no. During one concert in Stamford, Connecticut, she meets Geraldine Farrar. Geraldine, I put in here, she's big shit. I looked at her, I, I researched her a little bit, and she's just like very dramatic looking, like very just like long hair and her clothes are clinging and falling off of her body, dramatic (laughs) opera singer. And she's got all these big fur hats and she's a lot of photos of her just laughing, you know, with a glass of wine in her hand. I'm like, I want to hang out with this lady. (laughs) (laughs) So she meets Geraldine. She's a soprano opera singer. She's the original star of the New York Metropolitan Opera's Madame Butterfly. Oh, wow. Yeah, which that is one of... That is the pinnacle of opera. Opera, yes. So Farrar was so impressed with Williams's voice that she befriended Camilla. And she took her under her wing. She became her mentor. So Geraldine wrote about Camilla. She said, I was quite unprepared for this young woman's obvious high gifts. I should like to voice my unsolicited appreciation and the hope that under careful management and encouragement... The rich promise she shows will mature to even higher artistic endeavors. Farrar introduced and helped Camilla sign a recording contract with RCA Victor and to break into the highest levels of American opera. Yeah. Farrar was like, hey, pay attention. This girl is amazing. Because because then having a a record contract like that Mm -hmm. means that her music and her voice will be accessible to people who would never go to the opera. Exactly. Like me. (laughs) (laughs) Camilla was the first African-American woman to receive a regular contract of that nature. Geraldine wrote to an empresario. Do you know the definition of that word? It's like the person who does like the bookings and the financials and like marketing for opera houses. uh, No, I don't think so. No? Maybe. An empresario? Mm Mm-hmm. I don't have my phone with me. I thought it was, um, I don't know. I don't know what I thought it was, I guess. Well, his name was Arthur Judson to help get Camilla a manager. She's like, she needs a manager. Get her started. Camilla is quoted as saying, Arthur didn't believe the great Geraldine Farrar would take time to write a letter about an unknown little colored girl. When Judson confirmed it really was Miss Farrar, he was dumbfounded. Huh. Yeah. (laughs) Well, that's some assumptions you're making, fella. Exactly. Jesus. I know. A little colored girl. That just like that kind of like made the hair on my neck stand up i hate i hate that so in the same year she took top honors in the philadelphia orchestra youth concert editions and was engaged as a soloist for the philadelphia orchestra geraldine thinks camilla should play madam butterfly she's like i originally played this role i think you would be perfect for it i can help you train for it i think you need to do this role wow she yeah, started at the, the New York Metropolitan Opera. Does she want her to do it at the at yes? Wow, at the City Center Opera Company of New York. So she start, you know, Geraldine starred in the role. She was renowned as one of the best that portrayed the lead. Um, the lead is Chow Chow San. Geraldine arranges an audition with Laszlo Halaz, the director of the City Center Opera Company of New York. The war with Japan had left a bad taste in people's mouth about that play, though. Um, oh. It had been prohibited from being ran. So Halaz is going to wait, and he's, but he commits, and he says, if we do this play, it's going to be Camilla's part. When the play was able to be performed, it was May 15th, 1946. Camilla made her debut with the City Center Opera Company in New York as the role of Madame Butterfly, and the role became an instant success. So not only is it a very delicate subject matter coming off the war, they are putting a African American woman woman as the lead. Yeah. That is ballsy as shit. It's very bold. (laughs) Very bold. Everybody loved it. Said she was fantastic. Her performance was amazing. So in the next six years, the roles that she lands were some of opera's most prestigious roles. Netta in Leon Cavallo's Pagliacci. Mimi in Puccini's La Boheme, the title character of Verdi's Aida, 
She performed with the Boston Lyric Opera in Massachusetts and New York Philharmonic. She became the first African-American to sing a leading role at the Vienna State Opera in Austria, the first one to be invited. Wow. Yeah. In 1951, the singer won the role of Bess and completing the first recording of George Gershwin's opera, Porgy and Bess. Camilla married her uh, childhood sweetheart. Oh, <laughs> he was a civil rights attorney named Charles T. Beavers. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we were watching the Cougs and Huskies game. Yeah. And there's one of the football players. Last name was Beavers. <gasps> and Abby was like, <laughs> 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 you want to go get that jersey? I'm sure it's available in some sports shop. <laughs> you can get matching Christmas ones. Christmas idea. <laughs> You should. (laughs) Oh, my God. That would be amazing. So Charles was a graduate of Purdue University and the New York University of Law School. He practiced law in New York, where he and his wife lived. He was one of the principal attorneys for civil rights leader Malcolm X. Ooh, he's like a big shot. He's a big shot. I mean, I figured, I mean, he was like, like based on his pedigree in terms Mm -hmm. of his standings, I was like, Jesus. Yep. He represented Hinton Johnson, uh, the police brutality victim, following the infamous beating that took place at the hands of police in New York City in 1957, which was, I researched, did you, did you hear of that? I'm, I, I, it's like ringing a bell, but I can't remember any specifics. These New York City police officers beat a black man and two other men jumped in to stop and they beat the black man so bad he had brain damage and they arrested all of them put them in jail, even the man with the injuries. And Malcolm X had heard of the situation and came down to say this man needs to go to the hospital. And soon enough, like people were rallying outside and there was protesters outside. So um, the other two men who had jumped in to stop the fight were released, but they still didn't release the man who had been beaten. And so it oh, became Christ. yeah, a civil rights lawsuit, which of course they lost, but Camilla's husband was one of the representing attorneys in that case. I wish that that didn't sound like it could also have happened in 2018. Yeah. That's really sad. Yeah. I feel like, oh, well, you could tell me that exact same story and told me it happened last March and I'd believe you. Mm -hmm. Probably. Wow, America. We're coming a long ways. (laughs) Oh, goodness. Well, she appeared in concerts all over the world and performed before many dignitaries, including six U.S. presidents. In 1963, she sang with um, the accompaniment of George Mallory singing the Star-Spangled Banner at the White House before 250,000 people in Washington, D.C., preceding Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Oh, she was on that list. Well, Marian Anderson sang at that, too. Marian Anderson was supposed to sing that song, but she was stuck in traffic and didn't show up till later and then she sang at the same event so this is what i'm saying of these women's lives are yeah they're sort of running parallel running to one parallel another to one another which is really cool she also sang for martin luther king jr at the 1964 nobel peace prize ceremonies she made a tour of 14 north and central african countries on an invitation from the state department she continued to accumulate awards and honors throughout her career She was the first black person to receive a key to the city of her birth, Danville, Virginia. She was listed in the first edition of, um, have you ever heard of Who's Who in the World? Yeah. Yeah, she was in the first edition of that in 1972. Cool. And she was honored as a distinguished citizen by Governor Linwood Holton of Virginia. Camilla's husband died in 1969. So. Oh, wow. He seemed young. That seems young. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> like, what is he, like 50, 45? Yeah, it didn't say what he died of, um, but I'm, I don't know what he died of. I think he got ill. So after her husband's death, Camilla went back to what she started out to be, as a teacher. From 1970 to 1973, she was professor of voice at Brooklyn College, at Bronx College, and at the City University of New York. So she hit it pretty hard. Was she teaching at all three of those places at the same time? Brooklyn College was first, followed by Bronx College, oh, okay. and then followed by the City of New York, or University of New York. City University, yeah. Yeah. In 1977, she became the first black person appointed to the voice faculty at Indiana University in Bloomington. That's where she taught 
until 1997. Whoa, that's not that long ago. (laughs) So there was one little tidbit of history that I thought was really neat. Um, Going back to 1955, Marian Anderson made her Met debut as Ulrica in Verdi's Bio in Mascera. Camilla never was able to sing at the Met, and that was something that she always, I wouldn't say regretted, but longed for. Yeah, it was her goal. That was her goal. Um, Camilla was in the audience that night as Marion's invited guest. Oh. I know. I can't t- tell if that's, like, nice or not. <laughs> it was like, I know you can't be up here, but at least you can watch me be up here. <laughs> but I'm sure it wasn't like that, but it would probably feel kind of a little bit like, You're happy for your friend, and you're happy that there is a black woman on stage singing at the Met, but you wish it was you. (laughs) (laughs) You're sitting there just smiling, and there's a vein in your head. (laughs) So Camilla and Marianne knew that there was a lot of people looking at them. It was a very big night for both of them. That was a night Marianne was the first African-American woman to perform at the Met. Camilla said that with her performance in Madam Butterfly, she felt that it was full circle, that Marion had helped her and that she had broken ground in doing her performance in New York City, which broke ground for Marion to further perform at the Met. So I just really love how these women, it didn't say anything about rivalry. It didn't say anything that they had any bad blood between each other. It, it was just they were both kind of beautifully following the same path, kind of opening doors for each other. Well, and that's kind of, we can circle back to what we were talking about earlier when we were talking about Gina. Mm -hmm. And the reason why her comments are so off-putting is because it's creating an us-against-them scenario when that's the opposite of what she really needs to be doing. Mm -hmm. And these women understood that 50 years ago, is that it's, or I guess 60 or 70 years ago, it's not going to work out well for you if you take down the other people who are like you no lift each other up be there for each other support each other because if marion hadn't taken you know her money and supported camilla camilla couldn't have broken ground in new york city which who knows maybe if marion wouldn't have been able to break ground at the met it's like if you go against what were you saying one against the other yeah if you pit people if you pit people yeah against especially women I feel like you're just nailing your feet to the ground. Yeah, it doesn't help any women. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I found myself at times, I'm very competitive. And I've always had had a competitiveness with especially other women. And I've really kind of turned an inward look on that. And it's totally based in insecurity. Yeah, and it often, that sort of um, woman versus woman, in the long run, it always it always hurts both women, mm-hmm. right? Like, this is what I was talking about earlier about how if there are two slots open for women and the other eight are for men, the problem is not that your competition is all of those other women. Your problem is that there should have been at least five slots for women. Mm-hmm. What we all need to do is take stock in understanding that we should be fighting for each other in every aspect possible. That's why for me, and I'm learning every day more and more, but intersectional feminism is the only way forward. Men and women and trans and non-binary and black and white and Afro-Latina and Latina, like Mm -hmm. literally everyone, we need to understand that when one of us is oppressed, all of us are oppressed. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be about... Well, it doesn't really affect me, so I'm not going to really care right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I will eventually. Mm-hmm. It'll come knocking for your door, too. Exactly. One thing I thought was also really sweet is when her benefactor, Mrs. May Crumpler, died, Camilla sang at her funeral. Oh, nice. It was at the Mount Vernon Methodist Church. Uh, she presented the May Crumpler Memorial Concert at the City Armory before an audience of 1,500 people. And the concert was sponsored by and was a benefit for the YWCA, which I thought was really cool. That is great. Yeah. Even after her retirement, Williams lived in Bloomington, Indiana. She didn't move back home. And in 2012, she passed away at the age of 92 years old. Wow. She never remarried and she never had any children. No children, huh? No children, no. Hmm. 
I got most of my information from the website of the Libraries of Indiana Education, Wikipedia, www.blackpast.org, and www.dangene.net. Just two W's, not the three? www. <laughs> Sha, Taipei. <laughs> well, I, if you just hit www, you're just going to worldwide. W- you're not w- going w- to the World Wide Web. <laughs> worldwide. <laughs> I was I was really taken by by this woman, and I can't wait for us to put the music and p- photo of her up. Yeah, she's beautiful. I'm glad that you talked about her instead of Marian Anderson, because if you talked about Marian Anderson, I. I know a lot about her. Okay. Yay. <laughs> because you, you just, you nailed it on the head earlier. You said when you looked her up, there were hundreds and hundreds of bios and websites mm-hmm. and things like that, tributes to her. And I think part of that is that she is very closely associated with MLK. Yeah. You know, because she did perform at the speech. But mm-hmm. I didn't know Camilla performed at the speech too. Yep. So that, that was new information to me. And I've seen the speech lineup. But I've never really paid attention to some of the names I didn't know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which I should be. (laughs) But I appreciate that you talked about a different woman than Marion, because even though I think Marion deserved highlighting, she got highlighted in this, Mm -hmm. but she didn't probably need her own episode because most people know who she is. I wrestled with it. I did because I was going through Marion's history and I was like, oh, but she's so cool. And (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. But I was like, but Camilla over here, like, and you know, if you're reading like, or if you're researching something, you'll be reading somebody's bio and they'll have like a link and it's usually, it'll be a name or a place or something. Every time Camilla's name was in there, she wasn't, her name wasn't highlighted to a link. Oh, no. And I was like, that made me kind of sad because it was like, she sang with this person and this person and and Camilla and like no link. And so that's what kind of drove me to say, okay. You know what that says to me? Hmm. It it says to me the same thing we've been kind of touching on as a theme, which is that society decided that Marion was the important one that we were all going to hear about. Mm -hmm. And that has continued to be the case to this day. Mm Mm-hmm. Even though there was another woman coming up at the same time who achieved equally great accomplishments. Hers were not worth highlighting because we can only talk about one at a time. Mm -hmm. It also mentioned that Camilla, I couldn't find for what, but it said she was a two-time Grammy winner. I wonder if it was that record. The Gershwin. Mm -hmm. It was the first recording, yeah. I wonder if that's what it was for. If you go to the Grammy website, you'll probably be able to find it. Okay. I've gone there before. They have a pretty great easily searchable database all right i can probably look that up and mention that on our next next episode you know what i remember i just remembered Hmm. i forgot to do my correction (gasps) go ahead (laughs) (laughs) so last week i said that i had a correction and then i couldn't remember what it was so i think it probably got cut out in editing anyway but here was my correction two or three episodes ago we were talking about the election and about how stacy abrams and Andrew Gillum were both still in it Mm -hmm. in their respective governor races. And I said something about Andrew Gillum's opponent was Brian Kemp. That's not Andrew's opponent. That was Stacy's opponent. (laughs) Ron DeSantis was Andrew Gillum's opponent. And I knew that, but at the, I, anyway, all white guys look the same. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just joking. (laughs) I'm not going to say a word. <laughs> There's your laugh for that. I think that's a great note to end on. <laughs> we'll see you next time, folks. Yeah. Bye-bye. Or talk to you next time. <laughs> yeah. Well, you'll hear from us. You'll, you'll hear it. You'll hear from us. <laughs> have, a g- have a great week. Bye. Bye. Bye.